uh, Newport Beach Association of Realtors, I just wanted to welcome Senator uh, John Warlock, who uh, is, we're going to have a conversation today about things on the state level. And uh, 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 Senator, you kind of have a history with our board, uh, as I understand it, correct? No, you were a client of mine when I was a practicing CPA. Over That's what I mean. So, uh, I had a great time with Tricia Moore. She, she was the one who uh, hired my firm. She was a lot of fun to work with. Not that Kimberly isn't, but <laughs> I just, uh, had a lot of fun over the decades, the last couple of decades with Tricia. And so well, I got a long and, history with the Newport Beach Association of Realtors. And I know you're very, uh, you're very realtor friendly, which we of course appreciate. And, um, you know, we've, we going through this, um, uh, pandemic that we that we find ourselves in there's a lot of questions now as we kind of move forward we've crossed this threshold at least for many people i think it feels like we've crossed a threshold that we don't appear at least in on the county level uh to really have been impacted all that all that bad by by this i mean we do have have had deaths and such but i think at the latest latest stat that i saw over the weekend was um, 60, maybe 63 people in the ICU, 100 and, you know, just 120 people or so in the, uh, in the hospital, you know, for a county with uh, uh, millions of people. And I think I saw a stat of 6,000 hospital beds. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty good. So the question becomes, you know, what are, what's, what are the state's plans that you're hearing moving forward? Uh, any, any hope on the horizon for us? Well, it gets Orange County, Tony. It gets down to you know what's the model that the governor's using. Uh, when you put in certain algorithms, where you anticipate massive growth uh, in the amount of uh, individuals that contract COVID nineteen, uh, and and you get to hear the word ace asymptomatic over and over and over, and you you get to learn new words like spike and surge and. You know, we need to find more hospital beds. We better open up Fairview Developmental Center. We better, you know, get ready for 50,000 beds in the state. And then you watch the county's website every day and you see that those in the hospital stay at that range every, every day. We haven't really seen uh, any movement. So I've had a lot of fun talking to people that actually are modeling uh, and trying to, to see, you know, whether or not they're changing their assumptions a little bit. Uh, when when they look at, at at how it's going every day, and so you watch like the the new cases uh, on the county's website, and you watch it go down, and then all of a sudden on Friday, Saturday, no, no Sunday, it spiked up to like 123. So you go, whoa, where did where did that all all come from? And and, and are these statisticians with their models actually right? And and then what about first wave and second wave and third wave, uh, and then even the data, the the coastal cities like San Clemente, Laguna Beach, and Newport Beach have actually had a higher per capita cases uh, than inland, uh, you know, in Orange County. So what is, what is the ocean doing? And, and so you can see why Newport Beach, you know, is going to have some serious discussions again about whether or not to keep the, the beaches open. So, you know, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I try to listen to them. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but you have doctors whose, I guess, Hippocratic Oath is do no harm. So they're going to be more weighted to keeping everyone sheltering in place than they are to open the economy. Uh, they sort of feel that it's easier to resurrect the economy than it is to resurrect people that have passed away. And so uh, it gets to be an interesting conundrum uh, because I'm certainly getting calls from Newport Beach businessmen who are saying, you know, I will run out of cash. What do I do then? And that's my retirement. So where am I going to go? So I, I don't have all the answers, Tony, but you can see that the governor certainly has to listen uh, to, to his advisors. <clears throat> and I, I wrote an editorial for the Orange County Business Journal. It was in last week's edition saying, hey, governor, let's start opening up the economy. And I was really surprised to get a call from a friend who had talked to a doctor and, 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 a, and he said, you know, that the editorial was spot on. We should be able to take people that are vulnerable and, and they should stay in place, but the rest of us should be able to work with the proper precautions. But we as doctors can't really say that publicly because of 
the Hippocratic Oath and all the rest, so we have to be real careful. So um, there, there's got to be some balance, Tony. You, you know, it seems to me you should be able to show a house, right, <laughs> uh, with, with proper protocols and practices. And, and so what's essential and what not, is not essential is, is starting to really hurt this, this economy, and it can be permanent. Well, one of the one of the uh, questions that I had. So obviously, it's obvious the impact to local businesses, um, realtors, everybody. You know, the, the big issue that I one of the issues that, that I, I think we're concerned about really is, at some point, uh, businesses and people are going to run out of money, and and we know that. But there seems to be an awful lot of people who are in essential businesses, uh, maybe employed by the government or the state uh, who seem to be fairly, you know, this maybe doesn't have quite the sense of urgency for them. And, and one of my questions was, you know, cities in particular, and cities and the counties rely heavily on sales tax revenue to fund their budgets. And I, I think in Orange County, if I remember correctly, the, uh, the, the county in property tax, or in, we get our income from sales, uh, sales tax, but property tax revenue is also, the county only gets like 16 cents of every dollar uh, generated from property taxes. So when you shut down the whole economy, you don't really have an offsetting revenue source. And so one of my questions is how is this crisis going to impact uh, the solvency of our cities, our counties uh, moving forward? Is that the next big story? And, and is the pressure on that, assuming that, that it will be, is, is the pressure going to be on these cities and counties maybe to open up a, a bit sooner than they might otherwise want to because of that? Well, that is the biggest question to ask, Tony, because if, if a city is not doing well, uh, real estate will not do well. And so it's really critical. So let's go layer by layer. Uh, the first is, uh, let's say the state. The state has already experienced uh, more unemployment filings in the last six weeks than it did in the 59 weeks of the Great Recession. This has just come on like a heart attack. And since March 15, 3.4 million have filed. So that's, that's, that's more than the population of Orange County at 3.1, 3.2. Uh, so you take that into perspective, we're probably, we're, we're probably 1 11th of the state. So it's just, just an amazing, uh, staggering statistic. And the state's already distributed $4 billion in unemployment benefits uh, one billion just since a week ago Sunday. So the state is depleting its rainy day fund at a rather alarming pace. At the county level, when Arnold Schwarzenegger was governor, he needed money during the Great Recession, so he did something called the triple flip. So counties now find that they gave up sales tax and they gave up vehicle license fee revenues and they kept property taxes. So if you look at the county's pie chart of what it receives, 92% uh, probably is property taxes. And you said, you know, the county gets 16 cents. It's probably closer to six cents per dollar that the county actually gets to keep um, because we were a very conservative, very uh, tightly financed and managed county back in 1978 when Prop 13 passed. So we, we have such a small sliver even. So we're a major donor county to the state of California. We're actually the second highest personal income tax generator in the state, but we don't get our proportionate share. Yeah, that's really remarkable, by the way. I think I think the stats are the county gets six cents of every property tax dollar, the cities get 10 cents, and you compare that to San Francisco, they get 58 cents of every property tax dollar. And I think uh, uh, between the county and city of Los Angeles, they get 35 cents of every dollar. So we, we really kind of get the, you know, we really get shorted here for sure. Um, but the property taxes isn't what generates our, I mean, the property, is it, is it, does our main revenue source from the cities and the counties come from property tax or sales tax? For cities, more of it, it it's a case by case because every city is different, uh, but sales tax is a big part of it. Another big part is what we call TOT, which is a transient occupancy tax, also known as a hotel tax. So right now, the city of Anaheim, which is very dependent on the Disney Resort, is probably losing a million dollars a day in revenue. And Costa Mesa, which has South Coast Plaza, is also losing a tremendous amount of sales tax revenue. 
And what makes it really more onerous is that these two cities, when you look at their balance sheets, are, are, are in the bottom three of cities in the county. They have the worst balance sheets. Costa Mesa is number 34 out of 34, which makes no sense to me as a resident of that city. When you have the Harbor Boulevard car dealerships and you have South Coast Plaza, uh, I can just say that that the bargaining units, the, the, the employee unions have been a little too fortunate in their negotiations. And so we have in Costa Mesa, a pension plan that's only 61% funded. I mean, so a pension plan is also going to suffer in a recession because returns are gonna be negative. Contributions will go up, it's a math equation. And so Costa Mesa, Anaheim, I would not be surprised if they will have to be looking seriously at going to a federal bankruptcy court for a chapter nine reorganization with a plan of adjustment to try to figure out how to <laughs> move forward, especially when they've got massive self-created liabilities through pensions and other post-employment benefits. So that's gonna be interesting because real estate didn't do so well in San Diego when the New York Times called San Diego Enron by the sea. You know, if your city is having <laughs> trouble financially, that's gonna have a real impact on whether people want to move to that particular city. Ask Vallejo or San Bernardino or Stockton how real estate's been going for them and how long it took after they finished their chapter nine bankruptcy uh, to, to how, you know, how, how things started, how long it takes to improve. Well, that's a big concern. So I guess one of my questions are, and I don't know if you're hearing this from, you know, since you uh, are our state representative, I'm, I don't know if you're hearing from other cities and counties and is, it would seem to me this would put a great deal of pressure on cities to and counties to kind of reopen and get things going. Uh, but yet I I'm listening to like the Orange County Board of Supervisors meeting last week, I, I don't really get that sense. And, um, and given the, the, the meeting in Newport today, I don't get that sense either. So um, I don't know, what do you see moving forward? Is that the big, is that going to be the big story moving forward is, is, is the solvency of our, our cities and municipalities? I think the big story is going to be, you know, what happens to our cities and, and, and our school districts. Um, if you look at our school districts, uh, we have 944 in the state. And two years ago, I grabbed all of their audited financial statements and added up all of their unrestricted net positions. This is their owner's equity. It should be a, it should be at zero or above. You know, if you're below zero, you're a bankruptcy candidate. And, and two thirds of these school districts were already below zero and adding the positive districts and the negative, adding them all up, uh, we came up with $50 billion to the deficit. So our school districts before COVID-19 arrived were already teetering. And when the June 30, uh, 18 financial statements came out, they, they increased their unrestricted net deficits by another 20 billion. So they're upside down $70 billion already, which means that they're candidates for what we call a fiscal crisis and management uh, assistance team, FICMAD is what the state calls it, to come in into these districts and help them out. And, and so Laguna Beach, not doing well as a district, Newport Mesa, not so well. So there's gonna be some interesting issues for the Newport Beach area uh, if if uh, Newport Mesa Unified uh, has some some serious issues, if all the school districts went to the state and said we need to borrow, let's say the amount, let's say half of the amount of the unrestricted net deficit, where is G Gavin Newsom going to going to come up with 35 billion to help them out in loan programs? He's already depleted his 21 billion down to maybe 17 today, uh, and if the school districts show up. You know, it's going to be, it's going to be really awkward. So I, 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 I'm, I'm just talking real numbers, real data. I'm not talking, making anything up. I'm not trying to be alarmist, but we were trying to tell Gavin Newsom, Hey, we don't even have a rainy day fund for the schools. And in the last budget, he at least put aside 500 million, but that'll go in a snap, right? Once <laughs> these districts can't make any payments. So, so we have to look at the bigger issue, the massive elephant in the room, and that's the pension plans and that's the retiree medical plans. Los Angeles Unified School District last year 
had to put on their books and because it gets complicated, but the Government Accounting Standards Board didn't require that these liabilities be put on the balance sheet. So no one knew they were in the, they're, all this debt was in the shadows, but they had to put it into their audited financial statements last year and LA Unified had to add $15 billion in more liabilities for OPEBs, the other post-employment benefits. So there's a, there's a school district, we know we get to hear about them all the time on KNX here in Orange County, they can't rub two nickels together for, for, for students, and yet it, this liability is more than 20 grand per, per pupil. And so, so this COVID-19 is going to be a, 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 such, a, such a strong economic grip. You, you wonder why we are not being a little more aggressive and letting certain businesses open. I'll give one example. I mean, I'm getting calls every day, right? But hey, my daughter needs to go to, to the dentist. Her wisdom tooth is impacted and it's just creating way too much pain and the painkillers aren't, we aren't, we aren't gonna last for weeks. How do we get into a medic, you know, a, a dentist, you know, a specialist? I mean, when we did our budget hearing, we did it remotely a week and a half ago. Uh, so I did it like this from my desk in my district office. And, and we had such a long line of people calling in to, to give their testimony but a good number of them were medical practitioners. They said, my doctors aren't working right now. My plastic surgeons aren't working. My dentists aren't working. My hospitals aren't taking regular patients. They're all waiting for this surge to arrive. So my hospitals are struggling. And if we're not careful, Gavin Newsom and everyone else, we could destroy the most critical infrastructure we rely on. That's our medical industry. And, and, and when we really need it, I mean, what the LA Times today said, People aren't going into ERs, even if they've had strokes or maybe a heart attack, because they don't want to, you know, don't want to even go in. So you're right, Tony, something has to, you know, we have to find some balance here. So I know that uh, I think last week, uh, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell had suggested, floated the idea to the states so that, hey, maybe we'll let you guys file for bankruptcy. Don't don't come to us for, for, for money, essentially. And I uh, I'd be hard pressed to believe that that there wouldn't be some sort of state bailout. But do you think his concern is is that of uh, footing the bill for these unfunded liabilities or other things that are non-COVID related? Is is it the overreach of the state that you think the feds are are really worried about in this, or uh, is it just that the feds don't want to print more money? Uh, I, I thought Mitch McConnell was spot on, and you know, and sometimes the truth is a little tough. To understand. So a couple things. One, states cannot file for Chapter 9 bankruptcy. Uh, territories can, and, and Puerto Rico has been doing a good job of working in a federal uh, courtroom to try and figure out how to manage its debts. It was already in trouble before the, uh, the hurricane wiped it out a couple years ago. Uh, but we have some states that have been severely mismanaged. Um, fortunately, when I was elected in 2015, California was in 46th place out of 50 states. It's moved up to 42nd place, and not because we're doing much better, but because GASB, the Government Accounting Standards Board, has required the reporting of pension liabilities and retiree medical liabilities in the last few years. And so we've moved up while others have come down below us. So we're now up to 42nd place, but you look at states like New Jersey, which is 50th place, uh, Illinois, which is in 40, you know, in 49th in, in, in per capita unrestricted net deficits. Uh, we look at Massachusetts, Connecticut, these states are all on the fiscal ropes. And so McConnell was saying, Illinois, don't come to us and expect us to pay your unfunded pension plan under the guise of coronavirus. And he, he was spot on. Why should the rest of America subsidize and assist states that have not intentionally addressed their retiree and, and, and retirement issues. There is one state that in 1982 adopted a reasonable pension plan, and that was the state of Wisconsin. And they adopted a, 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 a shared risk plan, which says, wait a second, we're not going to assume we're gonna make 8% every year. We're gonna assume we're gonna earn maybe 4% a year. And we're not gonna give COLAs every year to the retirees. And we're not going to um, 
wait for you to, to, to we're not going to allow you to retire early, like at 50 for public safety or 57 for regular employees. No, you're going to retire like the, the private sector. And if you look at the Pew Charitable Trust report every year, you always see Wisconsin as the most well-funded pension plan in the, in the nation. They're always number one. They're always about 100%. And it's because they have a reasonable pension plan that makes sense from a defined, it's like a hybrid defined pension, defined uh, contribution, defined benefit, defined contribution. And so that, I wrote, a le I wrote an editorial for the bond buyer, which is like the Wall Street Journal for the fixed income, the bond market, municipal market. And I stated that states have to go to a shared risk model and that was the day before McConnell said, hey, states, don't, don't expect us to bail you out. So I'm hoping that maybe he saw my article. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're working to try and figure out, hey, unions, public employee unions, you got to come to the table and you got to get realistic because real life is cycles, whether it's the Great Depression, the Great Recession, or now pandemics. Uh, you don't expect a 7% rate of return every year, year after year. The Angels don't go to the World Series every year. You know, life has ups and downs. And so we've got we've to address this thing and we've got to address it quickly. So it sounds like the cities and counties, it sounds like all government is going to be, have to kind of deal with some really tough issues moving forward. And so that kind of brings me to a, a couple of other thoughts. Um, First of all, do you see any, this might sound like a silly question, given, given all that you've just communicated with the financial uh, status of the state, uh, any tax relief for Californians on the horizon? I mean, do, do you see uh, the state doing anything to offer some kind of uh, support or, or, you know, other than keeping things shut down? I mean, there's a lot of people who are suffering, uh, obviously. And so I guess what's the state doing to ease that burden? What state are we talking about, Tony? Our state, <laughs> California. <laughs> I know. All right. Well, the, the, I guess I, I guess I see your answer. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I I've been referring to a lot of charts and numbers, and so that, that's all available on my blog and on my Senate website. If someone wants to do the research um, and and see, you know, how their cities are doing. Uh, that's all up there, and, and if you can't find it, let me know, and and, and we'll, we'll get our, we'll give you the links. But but California historically has tried to continue raising taxes. Jerry Brown did it with Proposition 30, and then it was, I think, with Prop 55, you know, kept it in place. So there's no such thing as a temporary tax. But you will hear the need for a temporary tax, right, Tony? You can just see this coming. You see Gavin saying, "Well, we just need to do this for a couple years to to dig out." You. And, and, you know, we've already got split roll coming up in November. And, and that was a union led uh, initiative that said, wait a second, we've got to change how commercial property is taxed because this 2% per year isn't really fair. Well, that's going to be a massive hit to a lot of uh, this state because small business owners uh, own these small little, you know, real property where, where jobs are uh, held. But, but the unions went after split roll because they knew they had to pay for the pensions. And so it was already in play so that they could find another revenue source to start paying CalPERS more money. What happened is CalPERS, the, which is the state's major pension plan and probably the largest in the nation, um, they were at 100% funded in the late 90s when we enjoyed the dot-com boom. And people are kind of funny. They, they kind of think this way. Yesterday is today is tomorrow. If real estate prices are going up every year, then they're going to keep going up. Well, no, they, they actually go up and down. It's kind of cyclical. And the board of CalPERS said, boy, we are making so much money. We're fully funded. The stocks are trading at 60 times earnings per share, way beyond, uh, beyond the norm. Uh, maybe we should, and they should have said, maybe we should sell those stocks convert it to cash, and then buy bonds that pay 8%, and then they would have been fully funded, and they would have been funded you know, and meeting their, their investment goals for the next 10 years. No, they said, why don't we improve our retiree benefits by 50% and make it retroactive to the date of hire? So overnight, a fully funded pension plan became two-thirds funded, and that was in 1999, and here we are 20 years later, 
and we're still at two thirds funded. You know, that, and, and so so this animal has to be fixed, and it and and that's going to be the big deal, and that's why uh, uh, you're you're seeing the union saying we got to find more revenue. So you're not going to see, I don't think, Gavin say, oh, we're going to reduce your income tax rate from a max of thirteen point three percent to something lower. To yeah, they can't afford it. So, you know, I know there's been some, um, some discussion kind of floating around about the state enforcing some kind of uh, 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 mandatory like decrease in rents uh, that can be charged. Um, what do you know about that? Have you heard, have you heard that at all? That's Kings bill, 828, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a whole kind of part of the, I think, moratorium, the 828 is the moratorium on foreclosures and unlawful detainer actions. I don't, I don't recall if that, if that uh, required a decrease in rent, but that is actually something that I do want to talk to you about as well. Um, your thoughts on 828 and if you've heard anything about a, you know, a rent control, like, or, or decreasing rents as a result of this pandemic forcing that. Yeah, well, the King has a bill that would reduce rents by 25%. And so I, we might want to relook at A two eight. I think it's in the same bill. Um, mm. So let me give a little tutorial on what what happens in Sacramento. Philip Ting out of San Francisco is the chair of the Assembly Budget Committee, which makes him really powerful because he can dole out um, money to Assembly members and senators. Uh, to, to, to throw pork around their districts. It's pretty tacky, but that happens even here in Orange County. Um, but he's very powerful. So when he introduces a bill, because we have not a herd immunity, but herd mentality in, in Sacramento, all the Democrats will probably vote for it. The Republicans will be opposed. So right now I'm getting lots of emails and calls. Please be opposed to uh, AB828. Well, you don't need to call the Republicans. Republicans, you know, they voted against AB5, which is another bill which deals with independent contractors versus common law employees. One Republican voted for that bill, and he did not make it through the primary. So, you know, we, we, we're, we're, we learned that you should not vote for certain bills. So you don't have to worry about a Republican voting for that kind of bill but you have to worry about the Democrats. So you're looking at maybe uh, Assemblywoman Cotty Petrie Norris or Senator Tom Umberg, if you're one, someone in the Orange County delegation, they're the ones you need to contact. And they might be calling Philip Ting saying, hey, your bill's a little difficult for my real estate constituents to swallow. Can you, can you, uh, you know, give me a, a, a pass and not count on my vote? And so they'll probably negotiate that, but that's how this whole thing works. But if, if, if Assemblyman Ting doesn't have enough votes, he'll be putting lots of pressure on the, the Democrats in our delegation to, to come on board. So there's the little, you know, the, the, the fun behind the scenes kind of activity. So if you want to do phone calls and if you want to do emails, you don't have to do it with the Republican elected officials, do it with the delegation members on the Democrat side. All right, fair enough. Well, I know on AB 28, one of the other um, things with that is the uh, moratorium for, um, you know, on foreclosures or any kind of unlawful detainer action. And I, I personally have, have talked to a couple of landlords who are really, really concerned about this because, um, you know, they're feeling, you know, they're, I've had some landlords who said, hey, I'm really kind of a fearful to, to release my property, even though they need to because they're afraid that they're going to get somebody who's going to come in and stop paying and make, you know, some claim that it's, you know, virus related or something like that. And all of a sudden now they, they've got a, a person in there that they, that they cannot get out. And one of the things I noticed about uh, uh, ABA 28 was that bill stays into effect until I think January 1st, uh, 2022. So, or, or until the state of emergency is lifted and, I don't know. I, I, I don't see any indication of a state of emergency being lifted anytime soon. So uh, these issues with the rent decrease and also the inability to, to get a tenant out that doesn't, that doesn't uh, pay the rent um, 
I think those are those are big issues, and, I, and it's, it is putting a great deal of fear and uncertainty, unnecessary uncertainty, I think, in the in the marketplace that landlords are having to deal with. And, and they should be nervous, but maybe there's some thing that maybe you could consider, Tony, and that is because of the coronavirus, uh, we're supposed to return to Sacramento uh, on Monday. I'm supposed to fly Monday morning back. Uh, and we're supposed to go back to session, but we're hearing rumors and we'll find out sometime this week whether or not we should still stay here in our district offices and, and, and shelter in place. But when we get back, we're gonna have a very short time frame to address our bills and every legislator in the Senate is given 20 bills to do if they want and every assembly person gets to do 25 if they want. But we're already being told, hey, cut your bills down. So I've already cut mine down to eight. And I'm already being told by some of the committee chairs, get, get ready, we're not gonna do your bill. Um, so the, 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 yes, the committee chair is gonna look at Ting's bill and say, look, <clears throat> your bill is gonna be heard in committee, but when it gets heard, we're gonna have so many people coming to testify against your bill that it's going to take, let's say six hours just to hear your bill. And you know, because our, our session has been narrowed down so much and, and maybe we don't have enough large committee rooms because we have to practice social distancing. So, you know, people can't sit next to each other. So therefore we really, how do we, how do, we do your bill and, and, and consume that much time when I've got other committees that have to use that same room? So you may find leadership saying to Assemblyman Tang, save your bill for next year, not this year. And so that's, that's what you have to kind of hope will happen uh, in 2020. Well, we certainly do. So one other thing, this kind of goes into this whole idea of taxing, uh, taxation, and specifically I wanna bring up Proposition 13. I don't know, because uh, I think this is kind of tangentially related you know, the big fear is, and as you know, the history of Prop 13 kind of originating, I think, down here in Orange County, and uh, um, and the state has really wanted to kind of repeal that or, or, or water that down for a long time because of the need for income. Um, we are aware at the, at the Newport Beach Board of Realtors, um, the California Association of Realtors is sponsoring a November ballot initiative that's called uh, the Family Home Protection and I think Fairness Property Tax Act. And uh, just for the members who are, who are watching who aren't familiar with this, this is a very important thing that's coming up in November and CAR is pushing it. And it's basically, it's something that, uh, that our association vehemently opposes. Um, and basically it's, it's kind of two things couched in one essentially. It's a, uh, as you know, right, currently right now, if you're over 55 years old, you can, you can, transfer and you sell your property by something of equal or lesser value, you can, uh, you can transfer your property tax base that you had for a long time to that new property. Um, I think that's under prop, uh, prop 58 or prop 60. And, um, but it's only countywide that you can do within certain counties. And, and this bill is, is, is the good part of it. It's just, they're trying to say, Hey, well, we're going to enact this and push this and this way you can go anywhere in the state. So you're not restricted by counties that would cooperate. But the big downside uh, of that uh, of that bill that we see is that basically it changes, uh, it does create a split role in that number one, commercial property, it's Prop 13 for commercial property uh, go, goes away. And in addition, in addition, it's not just commercial property, it's basically any property that's not your primary residence. So it's basically anti-rental property as well. And, um, and so if you go to transfer a property to, uh, you know, to, to a family member that's not your direct child or grandchild, um, you're going to lose those Prop 13 protections. You're, and, I, and the big fear is many, many people who own uh, rental properties, who might own one property, who might own a, a business that's tied to property, you know, like a farm or something like that. Um, you know, when the, when the head of those households pass away and go to, to go to give the, that, those assets to a family member, um, they're, those people are going to be forced to sell their properties because they won't have any, uh, any, any, any way to pay the new indexed tax rate. Um, 
and so it's something that we at, in, at Newport oppose, but I, but I just wanted to see, are you familiar with that kind of, uh, with CARs kind of pushing that for November? Going on, so let me make sure I, I, I'm clear on what you're asking. Um, one is is uh, the split role that the unions are trying to do on commercial property, and then the California Association of Realtors is working on a ballot measure as well, which didn't pass the last go round, but is is trying again. Which I think is so. So you're talking not about your. I'm talking about this. I'm talking about the CAR, the Cal, the, the, the bill that's good, the, the, the ballot initiative that's coming up in November that CAR is pushing, um, which kind of rolls in kind of a split role. I think it rolls in kind of both a split role and uh, several things. And you said, I'm trying to clarify. Yeah. Is that something that CAR is pushing or is opposing? Because you used the word opposing a couple of times. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the Newport is opposing Newport Beach Association of Realtors, but the California Association of Realtors is, wants to sponsor it and put it onto the ballot. So we're kind of bucking the trend and not supporting something that, that they want to push. And it's being done under the guise of tax portability that, you know, if you're over 55, you can, uh, you know, buy something else, but they're not really pushing, promoting the downside, which is a lot of people are going to lose their property tax protections or get hit with big, uh, big taxes if you know a parent or somebody passes away and leaves property to, you know, other family members. Well, I don't have a good answer for you, Tony. Uh, let me do a little more research because uh, it, it was my recollection that I supported the last effort. Um, but now that you've you're telling me that you're not comfortable with it, let me let me noodle it some more and not make any commitment either way at this point. Yeah, well, Kimberly can get you some information on that. I just know it's going to come up on the ballot. And so uh, uh, in November, I think, is what they're shooting for. So uh, yeah, I, I, I've, got, I've got the information, but what I don't have is the uh, internecine conflict here. And so let me work on that. Okay, fair enough. Well, great. Um, well, first of all, um, I, I wanted to just right now, just quickly, uh, if any of our members have additional questions that they'd like to ask you, uh, I'd like to kind of give them this opportunity to open the Q&A uh, box or the chat box and uh, happy to pass those questions along. Um, uh, you know, Tony, I know, yeah. We do, we do have one question here from, okay. from Al Martini. Uh, to the Senator, how could the state approve 60 million bond, not fund the high speed train to Vegas, which equates to 2.4 billion in bond issues paid by the state? How, let me repeat the question, uh, Kimberly. How can the state approve the bonding of the high speed rail to Vegas? Was that the yeah, I think I, I think I think I think it sounds like more of a a, a, a question than a state a, a statement than a question. You know, we had that high speed rail bond that passed some years ago uh, to Vegas, and uh, here we have this incredible debt that we're, we've assumed for that um, that doesn't look like it's going to go anywhere. So, what is the status on that? Well, the, just to clarify, it's actually high speed rail from San Diego all the way up to San Francisco that we have that voters approved. Uh, and that high-speed rail is still being built. Um, it is something that is out of the hands of the legislature, and it has to be uh, stopped by Governor Newsom. And he has, uh, in his state of the state last January, said, let's get real on this high-speed rail, and then had to backtrack. Uh, high-speed rail is one of the most amazing boondoggles in this state. And it's a massive disconnect with what's happening right now in California with three and a half million people unemployed. Uh, and, and we're still spending $500 million a year to build this you know, train to nowhere. So I'm with Al, it, it should be stopped immediately. But my research and all my efforts say it's gotta be done uh, by the governor. And so you'd have to make the appeal to him. Okay, very good. So, uh, by, by the way, one other question that I had for you, is there any um, 
you know, other than what we've talked about, some of these uh, bills that are floating around in the CAR ballot initiative, uh, any other attacks that you see coming on Prop 13 moving forward? I, I, I'm just curious if you see this crisis is being is going to put a lot of pressure on the state to try to want to try to unwind those protections that we've enjoyed for so many years here in the state. Well, it, it, it's a good role that, that has been as we, you know, more focused on, on that particular effort. Um, we're also seeing uh, rent control come back. That's been a real interesting uh, issue. Um, last year, some pretty influential friends of mine uh, that are involved in real estate uh, came and visited me uh, at the last week of session and they said, look, we have uh, been watching this legislature and we're a little nervous. The majority party can do something by itself without a ballot measure. And we just saw the state of New York, their legislature pass a, a, a rent control law that was extremely onerous and anti real estate landowner uh, and so what we'd like, what we did, what they did is they hijacked a bill by David Chu and they said, um, we want to adopt some kind of rent control that we can live with. Um, we want to have at least the ability to raise rents 5% per year plus COLAs. We want to not have it apply to buildings that were built in the last 15 years. We don't want it to apply to principal residences that aren't owned by corporations. And so I said, so, so what you're asking is you're asking for me to approve your terms of surrender. And they said, yeah, exactly. We own all these rental properties up and down the state. And Weinstein, who did Prop 10 a year ago, is coming back with another rent control bill proposition, excuse me, and he's gathering the signatures. And it would be wise if we had some kind of bill in place to show the taxpayers that the ballot measure is unnecessary. And that's why we would like for you, Senator Morlock, not to beat the crap out of it on the Senate floor when it comes up. So I didn't beat the tar out of it, but I did say that rent control is like someone taking a chalkboard and there's fingernails down. So that's, that's what that does to my spine. I just get uh, quivers. But because of the concern that they had, I decided to lay off. And that means I didn't vote yes, but I certainly didn't. I didn't, I didn't vote. I de definitely didn't vote yes, but I, but I didn't vote no, just out of respect for a good portion of our community. And, and I know that kind of upset the uh, California Association of Realtors, but it was done out of the sadness of the state of our state that you have to put something that you can kind of live with as opposed to having to maybe deal with something that you can't live with. And so I went out of my comfort zone and supported SB 50 uh, last year, um, something that not, not too many Republicans came on board with. I was even a co-author. Uh, just trying to say, hey, LA, San Francisco, you got to wake up. You got to provide more housing units. Uh, but now with COVID-19, I don't know if I'd still be there. And maybe maybe density is not the answer anymore. And then, so there's still a lot to discuss. But that's a little long answer about the fun that we're having in Sacramento and why it's so anti-business. And I'm kind of hoping when coronavirus is done and we're back to normal, that Sacramento wakes up and realizes how important business and real estate is to the financial revenues of the state that they, they start to realize things a little differently because they've been always assuming that we could always ask for more. We can always tax you more. We can always add more. We can, you know, we can do the split role. We can, you know, do bonds. We can do this and that. And, and I, I think this is a real wake up call to Sacramento to get a little more prudent and a little more fiscally um, uh, in tune, be better stewards of your money. Well, uh, I appreciate that. appreciate that uh, information. And one thing that, uh, you know, I can't remember if we discussed this while everybody was on or if it was just, just before we started, 
but I wanted to mention, does the state have, just as kind of a final word, uh, does this, so does the state have any plans to open up? I mean, did, I'm just curious as to what communication you get, the Republicans have, or the Democrats for that matter, with Gavin Newsom in terms of does anybody know what the policy is going to be moving forward, uh, what the plan is moving forward, other than just you know hearing, uh, you know his 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 updates, um, you know publicly. I mean, any thoughts about what the state's got planned moving forward, or are we all just kind of flying blind at this point? We're all in new territory, and the governor does his press conference every day at noon and talks about meeting the moment and, uh, you know, in real time and all of his phrases that, you know, in his $5 words. Um, but we do, as, as Republican senators, uh, our caucus does have an occasional phone conference with his key uh, staff members just to kind of keep us up to date, but I don't know if we're really learning anything more than what you're getting from the main media. Uh, I'm finding from my Democrat colleagues that they find out about his initiatives about five minutes before he announces. So they're in the dark just as as much as we are, but we're in a recession. This is going to be the mother of all recessions. I can still remember, Tony, I don't want to be too negative, but you know, I'm old now. And in the early 90s, when I had my practice, uh, I had one real estate client kind of lament that he had not closed an escrow in three years. And so that may be what we're looking at for the next few years. Um, if people are, are finding that their reserves have been wiped out, that could have been the down payment for their next house, right? Uh, we're we're going to see the reverberations of this for a long, long time. And I, I, I sort of wish that there was a, more of a business approach to the whole thing, but you know, that's Gavin's decision to make. He, we gave him a billion dollars and we were asked to leave town on March 16th. And so we're sitting here going, well, why would you spend half of it on face masks from a company in China of all places? when we could set up equipment and start producing N95 masks here in California, put people to work. Uh, so it's all dependent on our, on our governor and the uh, model that he keeps looking at. Uh, but I, like yourself, as we opened up, we're seeing hospitalizations hold steady. We're seeing ICU holding steady. Uh, so it seems to me that we could start cautiously opening up the economy. You know, if I can go to the grocery store and be responsible, wear my face mask, go up the right aisle, the right direction, you know, to save six feet and you know, the rest, uh, it seems to me we should be trusted and we should be able to do the same just about every other uh, opportunity. And we've got to get this economy going because it's going to be, uh, in my opinion, my projection, it's not going to, it's going to be a long recovery. It's not going to be, fun at all. It's going to be very painful. And, and your industry will, will see it uh, just like you have in, in, in the early 90s and just like you did in the Great Recession. And we know how long it takes and how painful it is. And so I would encourage everybody to nurse whatever reserves they have and, and try to be as careful with how they spend for a good year or two. All right. Well, well uh, not quite the note that I would have loved to have ended on, but it is what it is. So uh, I thank you really for your time and really for your candidness, uh, Senator Morlock, and uh, really grateful to uh, have you as a resource to talk to. And I know just on speaking on behalf of the Newport Beach Association of Realtors, we're really thank you to have you on. So thanks for joining us this morning. Well, thanks for being a great moderator. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thank you.